the dust You make beautiful things You make beautiful things out of us He turns beauty for ashes Sorrow for joy Pain for rejoicing He's a good God this morning He is a good God today Give Him some praise this morning I know he could have left me where I was, but he draws near. He could have left you where you were. He could have left, he could leave you where you are this morning as you walk in the door, but you know what he doesn't? Because he draws near to each and every one of us. He steps into our darkness. He steps into our pain. He steps into our loneliness and draws near to us. He is a good, faithful guy and he never changes. And he loves you this morning. He wants to connect with you right where you're at. have the uh, wonderful opportunity this morning to just give back to the Lord what he first gave to us and so we're going to step into the um, the giving portion of our service and uh, did you know there's a difference well yeah I don't know um, there is a difference between giving an offering and giving a tithe one giving an offering is, is is actually a gift of generosity to the Lord but whereas giving a tithe is actually a, a, a position of honor, a posture of honor, to honor God what he gave us first. And so um, I just wanted to read this. Jesus was challenged by the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 15. In chapter 15, they're trying to challenge Jesus with some traditions. And they're like, hey, you didn't follow through with this, and you didn't follow through with that. And Jesus responds in verse uh, 7. He says, you hypocrites. <laughs> 
this is a great way to start a giving part of the service. You hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And I'm not saying that we do this, but it's possible. It's possible that, you know, we can pray and we can give and we can show up to church on Sunday and we can be a part of a life group and we can be part of a Bible study and actually withhold our heart from the Father. And so, man, I, as we just continue back into the song where if we give this morning, maybe just take a moment to actually posture our heart towards the Father in a posture of honor. God, I honor you with what you've already given me. God, I choose to worship you despite what I'm feeling right now. God, I want to honor you because you are holy and you are worthy. And so if you came prepared to give this morning, you can do that a couple different ways. There's an envelope on your seat back in front of you, and you can always take something physical to the corner of the room, or you can give online by texting 84321, or you can always visit our website. So let's pray. Father, we just, this morning, we just position ourselves just in a response that you gave your first and your best by sending your son to die in our place. And God, we respond with that by uh, first thing this morning, giving our first and our best in our worship, in our giving, in our, in our relationships, God. God, as we give to you, God, will you just turn our hearts towards you because you are, you are holy and you're worthy and you're worth it. Jesus, as we give this morning, will you Bless the gift of the giver of life. In your name, everyone said. By your spirit I will rise From the ashes of defeat The resurrected King Is resurrecting me In your name I come alive To declare your victory The resurrected King Resurrecting me by your spirit, I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name, I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. Your name, 
knows that God is good this morning? Man, well, do me a favor and just greet somebody next to you as you find your seats this morning. Man, did fishing kid, trip. Well, no, but a man oh, camp. Oh, wait, yeah, yeah, in the summer. Yeah, Got and it. then we did a kids camp, and then we did a youth camp, and what is it time for? A ladies camp. Woo! Although, we, we don't just, like, camp. We retreat, you know? We go really? in a hotel, and we have sinks that have marble around them. You oh, know? wow, that's fancy. Yeah. So, we are going to be doing a ladies October 20th through the 22nd at the Driftwood Shores Resort near the coast of Florence. Is that exciting or what? So you can sign up online under the events tab, um, but you want to do this quickly because we only have a certain amount of rooms saved and then they drop them in like three weeks, okay? So sign up as quickly as you can. Um, you can sign up at the Welcome Center or online. Super fun, yeah, super so fun. fun. Well, I've got one more thing for everybody this morning. Um, next week, we are starting our next growth track class. And so if you have been coming to our church for a while, or maybe you're new, here's the thing at Church of the Cascades, church really isn't a spectator spectacle thing, you know? And really the church exists to mobilize God's people and to equip God's saints for the work of the ministry. That, that's what church is for. And so if you are here at our church and you're like, I would love to get involved, I would love to be equipped, I'd love to be sent out, I'd love to, you know, whatever, fill in the blank. I would just encourage you, you're going to want to sign up for Growth Track. Normally it's a four-week class, but it's actually just a one-day class and we do feed you something to eat. Um, I couldn't tell you what, but but um, we'll feed you and uh, you'll be out of here. And so, um, but that's happening next Sunday. And so the best place to sign up is out at the Welcome Center or you can sign up online. So that's it. Um, okay. If you are 60 plus, raise your hand, be loud and proud. Oh, I forgot Woo! that one. All right. So after church today, out by the barbecue outside, we're going to have a barbecue for you right after church. So you are welcome to come. It's going to be a great time. Um, that's all. That's it? Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. have a good We are starting Sunday. a new series today. Um, at the beginning of the year, we did a survey because we wanted to find out what does God's people, what do they want to know? What do they want to hear about? What are they, what's actually going on in our hearts? And so we did a survey, uh, asked several questions. Hey, what do, you, what do you want to know? What do you want to hear from God's word? And so uh, we're going to start that series to answer some of those questions. We're calling this series, You Asked For It, because you guys asked for it. So um, that being said, get out your Bibles or your journals or whatever you use to take notes. And let's welcome up Pastor Anthony this Thank morning. You. Thanks, man. Awesome. Oh, man. Well, good morning, everybody. I, we've been really excited about this series because, well, I didn't think of it. You did. So it's going to be kind of fun. So if you don't like the sermon today, guess what? You asked for it. So uh, uh, there we go. So, but I love this. Uh, I love the topic today. Um, uh, but I will tell you, um, yeah, this is, this is a good one. So get, get ready. Uh, I'm not just saying it's because of me, but I'm glad you picked a good one this morning, and so this is going to be fun. Uh, we had a ton of fun this weekend at Newport. Where are my guys at? Are you here this morning? You alive? Okay. It was a ton of fun. We went up to the coast, and we had a chartered trip out there, and we went and caught a bunch of fish. And I will tell you, it was fun, but it was just a great time of fellowship and just a great time to connect. Uh, but it was the best part, uh, we, literally. Within an hour and a half, we limited all out on our fish. It was super fun. Uh, uh, but yeah, it was awesome. Praise the Lord. We can thank him for that. Amen. But they switched over all the gear to salmon gear, and my favorite moment of the trip was when Ezekiel reeled in this big old salmon. By the way, get up for Ezekiel this morning. He had a big old fish. It was awesome. Uh, but it was just fun seeing his, his reaction. We have a video of it somewhere, but we should show that. It was so fun. But anyways, uh, but we had a ton of fun just catching fish. And so anybody like to catch fish in here? I'm just curious. You, okay, cool. You're my people. I love it. Uh, it's so fun to catch fish, especially with friends, and I love fishing. But uh, did you know there's a story in the Bible where a fish caught a man. Do you know that story? 
You know where I'm going, don't you? Uh, yeah. Let me tell you about a guy named Jonah. Jonah, Jonah has an interesting story. Um, uh, before I jump into that, I, I, I have to tell you, uh, every time I speak on Jonah, I somehow in my mind say Noah. So if I say Noah in the middle of the sermon, just know I met Jonah, okay? There's something about that in my mind. So I just have to preface that. But God gives Jonah, not Noah, a message uh, to tell the Assyrians, the people of Nineveh, um, Honestly, they, they were in deep trouble. You know, God was ready to bring judgment on these people in Nineveh, and, and God felt like he wanted Jonah to share this message with them. And, and here's the deal. Jonah has some history. Jonah has some history with these people in Nineveh. They were, they were uh, an Assyrian group. Now, the, the group of the Assyrians were not good people. They were pretty messed up. They were ruthless. They were evil. Uh, they would attack just to gain more land, and they were, just, they were not a good people. And so Jonah has some history with the Assyrians. And so when God gave him this message to speak to the people of Nineveh, he wanted nothing to do with it. In fact, he was pretty frustrated about it, and uh, he went and did it anyways. No, not at all. In fact, he fought it at, at the beginning. He actually, when God told him in his heart, Jonah was very frustrated and angry. And so, guess what he does? He gets on a boat in flight. He is out of there. He's like, I am not going to do this. Uh, God, I hear you, but I'm, no, no. Uh, essentially is what he does. And he runs, and he runs, and, and, and he gets on this boat to, to go across the sea in, in an opposite direction. And as he's on the sea, guess what happens? Big storm. You guys know the story. I love that some of you know the story. So a big storm comes in. Big storm comes in. I mean, we're not just talking like a, a little bit of rain. We're talking a major storm. And they were actually worried that the boat was going to fall apart. And Jonah knows what's going on. In fact, he tells the crew, hey, actually, this is my fault. This is my fault, and, and the only way you guys are going to survive is if you toss me out of the boat. This is a true story. So he tells them this, and so guess what they do? They throw him out of the boat, and this is where it gets funny. Uh, when they toss him out of the boat, a fish catches a man. Yeah. It's weird, but it, it, and we don't know if it's literal or if it's metaphorical, but wherever you lean on in your theology with this, the reality is, is that this fish swallows this man whole, and he holds him in his belly for three days. I don't know, that does not sound fun to me. Um, but I will tell you, there are people, there are places and times in my life where I've been swallowed by a fish. There have been moments in my life where God, out of his love and out of his care, has put me in a holding pattern has put me in places and stopped me, maybe from doing the worst to myself. And I have to wonder the question is, when Jonah was swallowed by that fish, I have to wonder, because sometimes I really think, you know, this is God's judgment. He's getting swallowed by a fish. It's got to be stinky. It's got to be a terrible moment. I actually, when I see it, I see God's provision and I see his care. Yeah, it's true. Because ultimately what's happening in this moment, he's being swallowed by this fish. Uh, God is doing something in the midst of his heart. And I don't know about you, but... There, there is something about those times when God brings you to a place where you can't really do anything but sit still. Yeah. Have you ever been in those moments? Yeah. You know, I, 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 I never thought about this until I was thinking about it just the other day, but I believe that this is God's protection. You know, first off, it was protection because God was protecting him from the storm, you know. But secondly, I think he was trying to still Jonah's heart he, to be, being brought to a place of, of listening to God and, and surrendering his will to God's will. But third, I believe God uses it for transportation. He brings him actually to the, to the other side of the world to bring him to the place that God wanted him to in the beginning. And it's crazy how God can use some weird circumstances in our lives, isn't it? God can do whatever, I mean, he, and he does. He finds a way to get us back into the place where he needs us to be. And this is what happens. So guess where this fish vomits him up three days later? Right on the shores of Nineveh. <clears throat> even though Jonah relents to God's will and he's sitting there on the shore of Nineveh, he's faced with even a decision still. But he does. He relents and he goes to the people of Nineveh and he shares the message. <clears throat> I don't know his tone, but you have to wonder I mean, what it says. It's really only five words he shares with, but basically it's, it's not a nice message. It's a very harsh message. It's a very abrasive and a very, 
I have to wonder if it was done out of anger and frustration because that's what's inside him. And then something happens that Jonah doesn't expect. The people of Nineveh turn their hearts towards God. And then God rescues those people. I wonder what's going on in the heart of Jonah in this moment. The people that he despised, the people that he hates, the people, the frustrating people in his own life are getting the same grace that was shown to him. And and, and that idea wrestles with my mind when I think about this even in my own life because here's the deal. We all have Assyrians, don't we? We all have those people that have caused us pain in our life. Man, if you are living (laughs) pain-free, I'm telling you, it's just a matter of time. It's going to happen. But we all have those people. There's people in our lives that are against us. There's people in our lives that have hurt us, have frustrated us. There are people in our lives that we may even have bitterness towards and, 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 and anger. When my mom left my dad for the second time, I mean, I'll give you the end of the story. They're remarried now, praise the Lord. But there was a season in my life where it was really hard to forgive my mom. I remember a time when I was in junior high school, I, I, I sneezed on a group of, of, I don't know, like wannabe gangsters, I don't know, in, in, in my junior high room, but they were, they were like twice my size. I sneezed on his chicken sandwich as he passed me, and, and he threw it on me, and it stuck to my shirt, and so I'm embarrassed in front of the whole lunchroom, and I, and I go to the bathroom to wash it off. Well, guess who walks in the bathroom? There was five of them, and they beat the junk out of me. I want you to feel sorry for me. I'm just letting you know that forgiveness was not the first thing in my mind and in my heart (laughs) for those guys, especially as a junior higher. I wanted those guys to die, you know? I had a close friend in college. He, he, uh, one day he just ghosted me. He wouldn't return my phone calls. You know, he didn't want to hang out with me anymore. And he, and, and, and come to find out he was talking behind my back. And years later, when his marriage fell apart, I remember sitting in one of my church services and I was doing announcements that morning. I looked into the crowd and guess who was there? It was my friend. And I wish I could say I was excited to see him there. But after the service, he came over, he gave me a hug, he was really excited to see me and I'm just telling you, in my heart, there was something very ugly and very evil. I was angry because I realized I didn't have very much forgiveness for this guy, even though he needed a friend in that season of his life. <clears throat> Being a pastor, and if you've ever done any ministry, I think you can relate to this, but people say some really hurtful and negative things. They just do. It's just part of the job, especially when they're in pain. Hurt people, what? They hurt people. And sometimes those people come back into your life, and, 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 and I'm still called to love and minister to them, but I will tell you there are times in my life where I just don't want to. And I start realizing that there's some unforgiveness in my heart. Have you ever been in a situation in your life where you know God's telling you to do something, but all you want to do is give them wrath? And, and I don't realize, I don't think we realize that how often we are actually a bunch of Jonahs running around in this world. Because we've all been hurt, we all have pain, we all have situations where we don't want to do God's will because we're so focused on our own will. Even in our homes, right? If you have a spouse and you have kids, come on. There are times where you'll be faced with the option to give forgiveness or not. I've seen marriages crumble because they refuse to forgive. I've seen kids and parents that no longer have a relationship anymore because they've allowed unforgiveness to take root in their lives. So it makes sense when you guys asked for this topic to speak on forgiveness, okay? It makes sense because I think we're all dealing with having to come to grips with forgiveness. I think probably everybody in this room, including myself, there are places in my heart, there are places that I haven't fully surrendered in my life yet because I want to hold on to a grudge, I want to hold on to a hurt, I want to hold on to a pain. And what I'm telling you this morning, that that's not how God wants you to live. 
Jesus models a new way for us, and I'm so thankful for that. If you even think about Jesus' life and the whole mission that he comes down onto this planet for, he's on a mission for forgiveness. So what better teacher is there than Jesus on the subject, right? He talked about forgiveness quite a bit. In fact, I had to whittle this down or else we would have been here for three hours. But Jesus walked on this earth, and he lived like we lived. He had very much been through some very painful things, even in the last moments of his time here on this planet, right? People were not nice to Jesus. But he still stayed on mission. And he taught us how to forgive. So I want to just talk about some of those things that he talked about, you know. Uh, and, and I just, I really sense, even as I was coming into this this morning, I felt this weight that, this is something that we need to hear. These are the words of Jesus, and I think it'll change something in our hearts if we allow him to. So can I just take a moment? I want to pray for the sermon today. Can we do that? Yeah. God, we thank you that you are the authority and not us. That even though we are broken and we are, <laughs> we've made mistakes, you can still bring us to a place of restoration as long as we're willing to be moved by you. And so God, I pray that this morning that our hearts would be softened by your Holy Spirit. I pray that you'd use an imperfect vessel like myself to bring a message that brings restoration and hope and ultimately freedom in this place. And so God, would your, would your kingdom come and would your will be done in this room, in this moment. And in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said. Amen. All right. So first things first. And this is a Man, uh, this, I don't think we ever get this down, but man, this is really good stuff. The, the first point I think Jesus makes is this, is that he calls us to forgive a lot and then forgive some more. <laughs> These are the words that he says. And in fact, one of his disciples came to Jesus and he asked him this question. Peter, it says in, in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 22, it says this. It says, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times... Shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? I mean, that's a lot, right, Jesus? In fact, some other translations say uh, seven times 70. So the math, if you haven't been counting, that's 490 times. And I don't think Jesus is actually talking about a number. What Jesus is talking about is a posture in our hearts. Yeah. You know, his are... <laughs> Okay, I get tweaked when my neighbor's dog barks again at 4 a.m. in the morning, okay? <laughs> so this message is probably true for all of us, but it's natural for these things to build up in our hearts, especially when things keep happening over and over again, right? One of my flaws as a human being, I'm going to be super honest with you, I'm a flawed person, okay? Come on. But in my thinking, I believe that every kitchen sink in America and around the world that has two separate locations, one side for dishes and the other side for rinsing. Does anybody share th this thought? Okay, some of you may think I'm crazy, and I probably am, okay? Um, but I will tell you, in our family, it is always a battle for me. Now, they are probably right, and I am probably very wrong. But there is still a choice every single day of my life when I see a dish on the wrong side of the sink. <laughs> you guys think I'm crazy. I know. It's okay. But I'm being honest. I am OCD. I'm going to be honest with you. There are certain things that I choose to be OCD about. Okay? I'm not talking about my... I have a pretty awesome family, okay? I'm not trying to put them down. But I am, put, I am trying to make a point that there are choices that we have to make every day on what we do when things start to build up, when our sinks start to get full, right? So I think the heart of what Jesus is getting at is that forgiveness isn't about the other person. But when we harbor bitterness in our heart, it's like drinking poison expecting somebody else to get sick. It's better for you to continue to forgive always because the alternative will absolutely kill you. Side note, I think it's clear to understand, I think it's important to understand that God never said forgive and forget. I had somebody ask me recently, hey, wh where is it in the Bible that it says to forgive and forget? 
It doesn't say that in the Bible. It doesn't say that at all. Because, but, but it says, but he does say to forgive. And I think it's important to remember sometimes, especially if it's a safety issue, that trust can be broken. But still we can choose to forgive, but not forget. Trust and forgiveness are not the same thing, right? The two completely different things. But when the dishes are stacked up in your sink, instead of allowing them to pile up into your heart, frustration, anger, I mean, frothing at the mouth, that's what I do every time. (laughs) Jesus gives an alternative. Jesus said these words, and every time I hear them, it reminds me that I don't need to leave my sink full. He says, come to me all you are burdened, and I'll give you rest. Bring the dishes to me. Dishes, Jesus, are you going to wash those dishes? No, but maybe he'll change my heart. Have you guys seen the movie The Shack? Have you seen this movie? Talk, woo, talk about a kick in the gut. Woo. It, it's a hard one to watch. I won't ruin it for you. I won't tell you the whole story, but I'll give you the gist of this, this movie. It's a Christian movie. And in this movie, there's a dad who's got some kids. And uh, he takes his kids on, on vacation over at Wallawa Lake. And in the process of their camping trip, his daughter gets kidnapped. He can't find his daughter anywhere. This is a, the dad's worst nightmare, okay? And then they find her several days later, dead. A child predator got her. And in this story, in this movie, it goes through the, this guy's life whose life has been destroyed by bitterness and unforgiveness. And I would, I, I would challenge you, if you haven't seen this movie, uh, especially if you want to cry, um, but I would, see, I, would, I would watch this movie because when I watched it, it reminded me something about forgiveness. Because there will be times in your life where forgiveness feels impossible. There will be times in your life when you have so much anger and so much, well, in your mind probably feeling like you have justification for your feeling. And if you allow it to, it could ruin your life. And, and, and the ugly part of me, I'll be honest with you, is that I, I've been in situations in my life where I have not dealt with this well. I bet some of you in here would also be in places where you've not dealt with this well. But I don't want to go into the story again. And I, by the way, I've talked to my mom a lot about this, and there really is, has been healing in our family. But if I go back to the moment when my, my mom made a mistake, and, and after 25 years of marriage, she leaves my dad not once, but the second time. She married another guy. I just remember, I, I did not want that did not want that to happen. I wouldn't want that for our lives. I didn't want that for my dad's life. I didn't want that for our family. Ultimately, I wanted revenge. I wanted to feel pain. I, I, I remember shortly after them getting married, her second husband, a freak thing happened and he dies of cancer. And I wish I could say I was there for my mom and I cared for her. But what I actually did is I got very selfish and was happy about it. I know this is ugly honest right now. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm just being real with you. And I regret that moment because what had happened in that moment is that instead of being a son who cared for his mom, I thought about the carnage, what was happening in our lives. This idea of, well, that's what you get when you do that to my dad. This justification that rises up in us when something happens to us that we didn't deserve. But let's be honest, that's what we do. That's what we want to do. By the way, my parents are married again, and I have said that. I just want, to, want you to point out, God has done a miraculous work in this family. And if you want to hear my story, I don't want to say it all right now, because you've probably all heard it 20 times, but I will tell you this. Vengeance doesn't belong to us. Paul points out something that God says. 
I'm reading out of Romans chapter 12, verse 17. He says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Listen, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, what? It's mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Uh, in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil. Oh, don't overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't turn somebody else's sin into your sin. That's the snare of pain because hurt people hurt people. Have you ever said something that you regret? Okay, half of you are already sleeping, apparently. <laughs> or you regret doing something to someone that you love. Have you ever, have you ever been there? Yeah. And this is the worst thing about evil, is that it spreads and it multiplies if we don't deal with it correctly. I, still have, I have a scar on my thumb. I remember I had a friend who had a, this dog that was, it was dying. It was sick. I mean, they, they, they kept this dog alive way past when it should have been. They spent thousands of dollars on this ugly dog, <laughs> and, and, and it couldn't get up, and, and, and it was, I remember the moment that sitting in the kitchen, and, and the dog couldn't get up, and so I did like every normal human being would do, try to help the dog stand up, and I went to help the dog, and guess what it did? <laughs> it bit my hand. I mean, it like latched on. I'm like, how does this dog that's on his deathbed do that? And I mean, that stitch, it was terrible. <laughs> It was terrible. But because the dog was in pain, it bit me. It wasn't a bad dog. It had been through pain. And there are people out there that when you try to help them, because they are in pain, they will bite you. Not because you did something, but because they're in pain. <clears throat> and I know every single one of us in this room has been hurt at some point by someone. And maybe... It, this happens often, but when we are unfairly, is that a word? When it's been unjust, what we want to do <clears throat> is either even things out or bring justice at whatever the cost. <clears throat> Don't fall for that snare. <clears throat> and I'm learning this always leads me to regret. Have you been there? What if instead we had compassion what if, what if instead of me getting angry at this dog and wanting to punt it through the window, what if instead we had compassion? I'm convinced if we could see a replay of the last 20 years of people's life, of everybody that's hurt us, I think it would change the way that we would react. Because pain and somebody hurting somebody else is usually a result of somebody else's pain. I think if we could see that, I think we would have more compassion on people. It's true. Yeah. And it all comes down, though, with what, with who you give your pain to. You know? What do you do with your pain? Some of us medicate. Some of us run. Some of us actually try to do stuff with it. But if you hold on to it, it's only a matter of time when that sucker boils over, right? Mm -hmm. It's like I get a vision of an Instapot, right? That's been like eight hours, you know? And it's just full of pressure and somebody keeps turning up the heat on it. Eventually, what's going to happen? It's going to be a messy kitchen. Or, if you allow the enemy to have it and you convince yourself revenge is warranted, Ultimately, you're saying, God, I got this, right? I'm going to be the wrath bringer. I'm going to make things even. And then we bring on sin into our own lives in the process because we're not meant to repay evil. Amen? Yeah, it's true. We don't have grounds for that. We are not the judges. But the second that we try to wear this crown, we are setting ourselves up for a fall because we're not meant to be the judges. I mean, you don't want that job anyways, right? Or we can give it to God, the true, the true judge. And really, I don't really see any other options. But when God says to leave room for God, 
I think it means give it to God. And not just the thing that's happened that's been wrong to you, but I think he wants your pain too. He wants all of it. And then he can turn it for the good. Because that's what he does. He's so good. He makes beautiful things out of everything, doesn't he? The third thing I see from Jesus is he says, don't judge severely unless you want to be judged severely. Luke 6, 37 says, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. These are, these are Jesus' words here. Another way of saying this is out of Matthew chapter 6. He says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, what? Wait, wait, what? Your father will not forgive your sins? Are you kidding me? To the judgers and to the grudgers. This is the danger zone. All right? If you have a judgmental attitude about others, Scripture says that he will not forgive you. That's Scripture. If you have a different conviction with someone, it's not your place to judge them. Can I get an amen on that this morning? Unless you too want to be judged. We're not supposed to be judges. We make terrible judges. We're not, that's not our jobs. We are not the judges. You don't want that job, trust me, because If you take up the mantle of judge, you are also taking up the mantle of being judged. And I don't want the wrath of God in my life. How about you? If you're allowing grudges to take root, Jesus is saying God will also not forgive you. I know this is is harsh stuff. But guys, you asked for it, okay? Some people are like, hey, hey, is Jesus being hyperbolic in this moment? According to the Greek tense, this is true. The context of the passage, if you look at all of it and the theology behind all of this, that Jesus is being dead serious. This is a warning out of care and concern for his people that he loves. If you're harboring a grudge or bitterness in your heart, Jesus really is saying he's, you are keeping yourself from being forgiven by God. So, Pastor, you're saying if I, if I go to church every Sunday, if I, if I read my Bible, I'm, I'm doing life group, I'm doing all these great things, and if I, God's not going to forgive me? How's that fair? Listen, God has done everything he possibly can to bring forgiveness into our lives. He gave his only begotten son for us to understand this very important concept that forgiveness is what it's all about. Jesus was on a mission. He came down to this earth to give his life as a ransom for many. It says that he gave his life even in the midst of all the pain and the suffering. He did it. He did it for you and me to model something. I think when God says he loves his children, I think it means that he loves all his children. You, me, and anyone else that's hurt us, even the Assyrians. For us to be unforgiving to one of his children hurts him. I mean, if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. You go after me, I can hang. You go after my kids, It's on like Donkey Kong, right? Because we love our kids. And God is in love with you, and he loves you with everything in him. So any of us that doesn't want to forgive one of his children, he wears that, he feels that. And every time we harbor bitterness and anger and frustration, guess who else it hurts? It hurts another set of his children. It hurts us. And he doesn't want that either. 
Give it to God. Let him be the judge. Let him be the one who brings conviction. That's the job of the Holy Spirit and not ours. As much as sometimes we want to be. I think sometimes we want justice for God. God, I want this for you. God, did you see what they're doing? I got this. And we find ourselves in a really rough place. God, we're not going to let them get away with this, are we? But how much has he let us get away with? I understand that sometimes we just, our emotions overcome us. We get to a place where we want to bring restoration. And, but ultimately, what we are saying is when we go after that, we are saying, God, I would rather you punish me for my sins so that they get punished for their sins. It's kind of crazy, right? I would rather our God be even with his forgiveness than to be even with wrath because we all deserve wrath. I would rather God to forgive all of us than to hold all of us to wrath. And I know how easy it is to obsess over this stuff and it can become overwhelming, especially when we are hurt over and over and over and over again, especially people that love us. Corey Ten Boom was a famous author who helped many Jewish uh, escape the Holocaust. This is back in World War II. She tells a powerful story because she was caught trying to rescue these Jewish people and she was sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp. And she tells a story about her, her journey of dealing with forgiveness because here's the deal. This, this woman was a saint, man. She lived for Jesus and she loved people beyond herself. She even put her life at risk and she finds herself in this concentration camp and she had so many reasons to feel like her life was unfair. But she's wrestling with this tragedy in her life because she's holding on to bitterness and anger of all the things that have happened to her. So even years later, after all this mess that she lived through, she's still tormented by this un her inability to be able to forgive those that have done these atrocious things to her. So she prayed and she prayed and she prayed like, God, I really don't want to keep living this way. I feel trapped. And God answers her prayer to her. And in fact, a, a Lutheran pastor tells her this story. He points to this bell tower back in the day. Remember when they had bell towers? Have you ever heard one of those things? They're, you know what I'm talking about? They go ding dong. And, and he points out, hey, hey, every time that when they pull on a bell, that thing starts rocking back and forth and it takes some time. But eventually, it starts to slow down and it stops. It says forgiveness is, is, is the same thing. Because sometimes, we choose to keep ringing that, pulling on that rope. And we keep swinging the bell. And every time we think back to the things and the terrible things that people have done to us, we pull on that rope again and we revisit the hurt. We revisit everything. And then what happens is that bell keeps dinging and donging in our lives. And here's the challenge. How do we get to a place where we stop pulling on the rope? We stop visiting those moments. But if we can give those things, those pains, those hurts, those tragedies that have happened in our lives to God, eventually that bell stops tolling in our lives. Jesus said in Mark 11, 24 through 25, and this is it, we're getting ready to wrap up here. He says, but when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your sins. If you're still pulling the rope as you're praying to God, he sees that. And I know what he would be saying to you this morning. He would be saying, child, just stop. It's hurting you more than you realize. 
It's exactly why Jesus was instructing disciples on how to pray. He said this in, in Luke 11, 4. He says, and forgive our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. So he was teaching his, his disciples that's how we should be praying. But he's basically saying, hey, have a posture of forgiveness. Forgiveness first. I love the story Bob Goff tells, uh, Bob Goff tells about his daughter who, uh, who just started driving. When she was a little girl, he dug a hole in their front yard in front of a tree. He had a tin can and he put a note in there and he buried it up and 16 years later, when his daughter wrecked the family car. You're not gonna wreck our family car, I'm just saying. <laughs> he tells her, I want you to go dig up that hole. And I wrote you a note a long time ago. She digs up the hole, opens up the can and reads the note and it says, I already forgive you for wrecking the family car. <laughs> it's a true story, isn't that crazy? But it's a posture. How healthy was that for his daughter? You've already been forgiven. How healthy was that for a dad, right? I think that's a posture that we can have as, as God's people so that we can choose to pre-forgive. Forgive them. <laughs> forgive my sins as I forgive other sins against me. I remember Jesus in his last moments on the cross. Do you remember what he said? He says, Father, forgive them for they not know what they do. In the midst of him dying, crown of thorns on his head, blood streaking down his face at his back, full of pain. The one thing on his mind and his heart was forgiveness. God, forgive them for they not know what they are doing. Man, if we could just... If we could just get that in our lives and in our hearts. <clears throat> Would you stand with me? We're going to close. I want to ask the, the prayer team. We have our, uh, I asked the elders this week to, to come forward. Would you guys come forward and ask for just a, a time of prayer for us? And this is a no judgment zone. And in fact, this may be a little bit different because we don't do this very often, but I know where I'm at in my heart. There are some things that I still haven't dealt with. And there's still some places in my life that I haven't found forgiveness in. And I need somebody to pray for me. As we close in this last song, I want to give you an opportunity. I'm going to be up here. Our team's going to be up here. And we just want to pray for you. Some of us, it's bitterness that's taken root. For some of us, it's a posture problem and we need to change the way that we are thinking. We need to pre-forgive people. Wherever we are at, we just want to pray for you this morning. We want to do that together. I'm going to pray for us now and then we'll go right into that. So Father, thank you. Thank you for doing it first. For choosing forgiveness instead of the wrath that we all earned. And ultimately sending your son so that we may live free. Help us to fully understand that even in our own lives, Father. To take the model of Jesus and to be people that forgive first instead of doing what we naturally want to do and that's being full of, well, full of anger and bitterness and, and wrath and brokenness. I even pray right now that there's even some people, as I'm thinking about it right now as we're, we're closing here, that there's some people even in this church that have broken relationships with each other because of pain. And when we separate ourselves from others, we are, we are alone. And God, you never designed us to be alone. You've designed us to be in community with other people. And so God, I pray that even as people are, are looking at the life groups and signing up today, that there would be a, a pull by your Holy Spirit back into community for some of those people. Yeah. God, would you start in us? Would you start in our hearts, Father? We come before you. And we ask that you remove whatever pain so we may love like you love us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen.
So we're going to do this song. If you want to come be prayed for, come on up. We'll be up here with you, and uh, we'd love that. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. I'm going to pray for you, Angela.